Let me start with your your interest in the whole connection of the UFO phenomenon to the Nazis in World War II and the subsequent development of that after the Second World War. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it's important right off the bat uh, for people to understand that I think that there's a definite connection between the the Nazi UFO technology, uh, which I want to make some clarifications before we go too far into that, but uh, there's a definite connection between that and the secret space program and what you call uh, the breakaway civilization in your UFOs and national security state books. I think there's a definite connection there, but before we go too far, uh, I want to clarify something. The Nazis, as far as I have been able to tell, were working on so-called flying saucers, but these were not field propulsion, anti-gravity type of saucers. They were simply vectored jet turbine types of saucers. There are a number of patents that were taken out in this country by Germans that had been brought over here mm-hmm. uh, that kind of indicate, if you if you go back and look at some of the stories about uh, Victor Schauberger and Rudolf Fleissner, that this is the kind of craft that they were actually working on. Uh, there are a number of stories regarding Hanabu and Vril and these so-called Nazi field propulsion saucers that trap people into thinking that the Nazis, you know, that, that all UFOs are really secret Nazi technology and that it was really advanced in field propulsion. Well, the problem with those stories, Richard, is that they're all coming out of a narrow circle of neo-Nazis that were based in and around Vienna, Austria after the war and then to a lesser extent uh, Munich. So I, when I talk about Nazi UFO technology, I am not talking about that. I don't believe those stories. I don't believe the Nazi secret UFO base in Antarctica stories or you know any of this stuff. Uh, so that's the first caveat that we have to that we have to get on the record uh, that this is not what I'm talking about. Uh, the story that interests me the most with respect to some of this advanced uh, Nazi technology is the story of the bell, and this this story was broken by Igor Vitkovsky shortly after the collapse of the Warsaw Pact and then after German reunification. Mm -hmm. This was picked up by Nick Cook in his book, Hunt for Zero Point. Right. Uh, But Witkowski, I I got interested in the story, Richard, because what Witkowski did, it's a very rare book, it's called The Truth About the Wunderwaffe. And it's really an excellent book because the amount of detail in it uh, about the Bell Project as far as I was concerned, allowed you to go back and kind of try to reverse engineer the physics conceptions that they may have been playing with and what they may have been up to. So I became fascinated with that uh, for that reason. And I've attempted in, in the various books to kind of reverse engineer what I think may have been going on in their heads when they came up with this crazy device. Can we talk a little bit more about this? This is The bell sure. is very famous, infamous. Um, it's almost legend because as far as I yeah. know, all the, all the information about it came out, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, after the war during uh, yes. some uh, trials in Eastern Europe yes. uh, to, against Nazi war crimes. And uh, and locals, I believe, in Czechoslovakia talked right. about this experiment, and it, it was called Die Glock, the Bell. And mm-hmm. it involved, as Nick Cook wrote about way back in, uh, I think, 2002, that book was. Mm-hmm. Um, it involved, uh, like, rotating mercury. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. And it created a kind of a plasma field, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the effects of it were, well, what were the effects? That's the interesting mm-hmm. thing. It was deadly. Um, and it might have had some kind of, people have argued, some kind of field propulsion effect, but I've never been clear on this. All right, the Bell story is coming out of an affidavit uh, that was sworn out by uh, an SS general that was tried by a post-war war crimes trial in Poland. His name was Jakob Sporenberg. 
And all of the details about the bell are coming out of this affidavit. And the details themselves are both very specific and at the same time very ambiguous. And this is where the reverse engineering part comes in. But basically the details are that this device was about 15 feet wide, maybe 15 to 18 feet tall. It was mm -hmm. kind of bell-shaped. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there are indications that this was kind of a ceramic uh, covering of some sort on the inside of this device. Spornberg said that they had two counter-rotating drums. Now, he does not say whether or not these drums were nested one inside the other or stacked one on top of the other. Uh, in my view... So counter-rotating, one going this way and one and going this way. And the other going the other way, right. Now, inside <clears throat> of these counter-rotating drums, they put a serum, which was codenamed Serum 525, which he described, again, as being a heavy, cherry-red, maroon-like... Uh, substance that was was very very heavy and and again taking those details what I what I did what, and a number of other details like the fact that the Nazis were stockpiling gobs of thorium during the war and nobody can figure out to this day what they were stockpiling thorium for <laughs> but um, I came to the conclusion that maybe what they were dealing with in this substance was, first of all, a thorium isomer, thorium-229 isomer, and an oxide of mercury, which would give it that heavy, metallic, gooey, red-like appearance. And they were doing this in these counter-rotating drums. They put this substance in it and spin these drums up. And then they would pulse these drums with gobs, massive amounts of direct current electricity. And again, that's another little detail that you have to kind of reverse engineer because they built a whole power plant at the installation in, uh, in the Hartz Mountains where they were testing this device. Well, I'm thinking, well, why do you need to build a whole power plant there? And the final clue here is that people that were in the presence of this device said that it made a buzzing sound. The Germans actually nicknamed this device uh, Der Bienenstock, the beehive. So it made a buzzing sound. Oh. So I thought, well, that that's kind of a signal of, of a of a voltage gate opening and closing very rapidly. You know, you hear that buzzing sound if you listen to mm -hmm. Tesla coils going off. So I thought, okay, they're, they're using gobs of direct current electricity, so that's why they build the power plant there. They're spinning this stuff up. And basically, I think what they're attempting to do is they're trying to create a plasma out of this, create a differential plasma rotation, and see if they get some sort of gravity effect out of it. And they're measuring any time dilations, you know, following Einstein. Mm -hmm. They're measuring any time dilations they're getting from this from the from the uh, radioactive material in this in this substance. Again, so, I just want to. This is a chain of ifs. I just want to <laughs> stop you. So by time dilations, you're talking about any um, any odd effects in time itself. If it's affecting right. time itself, exactly. Right. Right. If you have if you have a measurable difference in the rate of radioactive decay of a known substance like mm -hmm. thorium right. that would have a, a measurable rate of radioactive decay if that varies significantly while you're doing this then you're getting a, a time dilation effect and they're getting a gravity effect well in Witkowski's presentation of, of all of this material he presents uh, the fact that certain uh, witnesses at the nearby uh, Gross Rosen concentration camp would see this kind of acorn device glowing a pale blue glow levitating above the tree line at night and, and he concluded that was a bell and I think he's probably right and here's the problem all it does is levitate it goes up and it comes down it doesn't you know it doesn't zigzag around in the sky like UFOs have been reported mm -hmm. to do so you're dealing, I think, here with, yeah, perhaps a, a prototypical... Highly uh, experimental. High-energy experimental thing. That and would it have been for propulsion, or could it have been for any number of other things, I would wonder, right? Well, the problem here, the problem here is, yeah, you can use it for propulsion, but it's killing everybody. The first time exactly. they test this thing, yeah, it zaps, you know, some of the scientists testing it into the nether realms. Uh, so... 
so you've got a device here that yeah, is clearly some sort of prototypical technology, but it's not flying around. They can't put it in anybody in it to pilot or steer it, and it ha still has to be connected to this honking big electrical plant. So, so we can say that yeah, this is kind of a step in the technology tree, but it's not to the stage that we get Hanabu and Vrilcraft, you know, flying around and flying to the moon and back and so on and so forth. No, it's, it's not that at all. Please hang up and try again.